Um, all right, so good morning, everybody. I am Lauren Zini from the University of Colorado Law School, and I'm up here with my colleague, Rebecca Shodi, and this is Marin Dowd from Barry University Law School. And we're here to talk about being the little library in a shared tenant LSP. Now I realize I've lost the slideshow, so I figure out how to progress slides. Did you turn the video back on? Oh, did you turn it off? <laughs> there we go. There we go. Awesome. Good job, order. Um, so we're just going to start by setting the tone of what our local implementations look like, so you can understand some of what we're talking about here today. So at Colorado, up until the summer of 2023, law and main campus were completely separate. Law was running their own ILS, uh, OPAC, and Discovery Services. Main campus was running duplicate services. We are physically on the same campus. We share an IP. I know this probably sounds a little odd, but part of that is because in the United States, most law schools are academically and financially autonomous from their main campus. And in many ways, that was just the way it was done for a very long time. As budgets and staff are shrinking, this idea of combining systems has become much more common. Because we were separate institutions for so long, we had very specific workflows that were very different at both campuses campuses that were catered to our special patrons. So when it came time to merge, you can see that law had a tiny little number of records compared to the rest of our main campus records. Um, so we merged, merged into a shared LSP um, as well as shared instances of UFINE and EDS. <clears throat> Looking at it a little more granularly, because I know this is what everybody is excited about. <laughs> uh, um, we have, again, that single tenant or institution with law being one of the campuses. We are the only library assigned to that law campus and all of our physical locations reside within that library. The exception location-wise for us is for online resources that we share many of those, I won't say all, many of those across all of the libraries on campus or across our physical space. So we have one online branch that we are putting in resources to from both libraries so that we can have a unified public display approach for all of that. Our main campus and us um, migrated out, out of innovative platforms. We had a lot of concerns about duplication of record numbers from going into the system because we did maintain at law still separate everything. We have separate instances, separate orders, we're using acquisitions units. It's all separate. If it can be separate, it is. And so at migration, we put L prefixes on our um, instance HRIDs for those incoming records, as well as L prefixes on our POs as they were being created. Uh, we had our vendor do this for it. Our vendor was in the index data, and they did this part of the mapping, so we didn't have to figure it out for ourselves. Uh, pretty much everything else on here is pretty self-explanatory. We, we did it our own way. Uh, we have all separate circles, uh, patron groups, library calendars, and we had to work out how to deal with that across campus. So now that I've set the tone for the back end, Rebecca is going to speak about the front end. So we are less separate in our front end, but we do have some separation. So on the discovery side, um, when we were migrating, we had, we, like including the larger library, main campus library had, and law, had hoped that we could go to a single user interface for searching. Um, but unfortunately that didn't really pan out. Um, so upfront, like the law library was very intent that we could have a like pre-scoped discovery interface for our resources so that our users, our law users, could maintain the same level of searching without having to navigate through multiple filters that they were sort of used to, so they could just see law items. Um, and with our original EDS implementation, we weren't able to do that. So what we ended up doing um, was having an EDS implementation that was scoped for like all of the resources on campus, and then having also a separate viewfind um, instance, which is has a, an entire campus scope as well as a pre-filtered law scope um, that allows our law library users um, to basically just search um, our, our resources and that just pre-filtered search is linked from the law library's cat or website. And so they don't even have to see um, 
the main campus's resources in our future still what? So I was at Hi at McBerry, and I was really excited when um, Lauren and Rebecca were testing around and we were talking about this subject because we're in kind of the same situation, but we're a little bit different. So unlike those lucky people who live in Boulder, um, I live in Florida, and we are in the Orlando campus for the law school but our main campus is in Miami Shores, a, a world away. And so even though we share a system, sometimes I forget that they're even down there unless something really goes wrong or we're fighting or whatever. Um, but we actually started out, um, and I'm relatively new to bury myself. So when I say we, this is historically speaking. Um, until I came there in September of 2021, they were sharing a Sierra um, a ILS and sharing just about everything. Um, and then the main campus made the decision to move to Folio. Um, we are also an autonomous law library in our US system. We really work alone. So um, short distancing can sometimes be a problem. Um, we have um, a closed library. We don't have public patrons. So we have a little bit less worry about what uh, patrons external to our specific law student and faculty users might have. Um, we merged into the single tenant of Folio with our main campus last summer. Completely, the migration was finished, although we're still working on things. But um, like Boulder, we are a very small, small subset of a very large subset of records. So we have 18,000 about instance records and they have about 562,000. Um, so we um, have that shared ILS with Folio, but everything else is, is, is separate. And so like I said, sometimes it's hard to remember we're even a part of them until we really have to um, work things out when they go wrong. Next. Um, again, M Miami Shores and Orlando are our two locations. Our campuses are main and law. Um, we add law to everything, even if we maybe don't have to, because Folio allows for those separate acquisition units. I don't take any chances. I make my people do. Everything has to say law in front of it, just so that if and when we have to separate things out, we can. Um, we have separate instance records, separate circulation rules, um, separate calendars, everything else is very separate. One area where we are very enmeshed is um, IT. And actually, IT in main, in main campus does almost everything, um, which turns out to be a benefit, but it's really it can get out of control when they don't really know what they're doing. And um, we don't know what they're doing. So but we're working through it. Next. So our discovery setup is completely separate. We don't have viewfind. We only have EPS, and we use e uh, Expose Locate for our discovery and OPAC layers. Um, again, we're completely separate, and it was set up that way by main campus, and I thank them for that because we really are able to do our own things. I will turn it back over to you. Great. So we're going to start with the pros. Maybe we should have started with the cons, but um, <laughs> it's always fun to group at the end. So. Um, for anybody that has to deal with any sort of contracting or procurement process, this first one should really resonate. Um, in the past, everything that we needed a contract for, law had theirs and main campus had theirs. We're actually meeting a campus efficiency goal by reducing that. Uh, we're reducing redundancies by having one set of systems. We're also reducing the number of contracts because we have, um, whether it's our proxy, um, vendor services, discovery, so on and so forth. Anything that's tied into the ILS, we now only have one contract for the entire campus. And as the small library, we don't have to deal with it. Uh, we are involved in the internal negotiations, but it's main campus that is shepherding that through the process with procurement and dealing with any back and forth with the vendors. I will give the disclaimer that when it comes to resources, law still does negotiate their own contracts because we have our own budget and we're paying for those. So this is just kind of LSP and discovery centric services. Um, it also means that as far as systems management, the lead is on main campus. That in our innovative system, uh, we had one person, that was me, uh, that was dealing with a lot of it. And we were at a point where we lost enough staff that we had actually started outsourcing a lot of this because we couldn't keep up with things. We couldn't get updates installed and so on and so forth. So this is a huge help for us that we now have somebody on main campus who is dealing with most of those issues. And then I deal more with just the law specific stuff with our users, our patrons, 
um, our orders and, and everything else. Um, flipping a little, kind of looking at other benefits outside of, of these, it's a lot easier for us to compare our resources. Again, we share a physical campus, we share an IP address. That means that our users have access to open campus things and for the most part, vice versa. We do have a couple of law specific resources that main campus users can't access that are electronic. Uh, when it came to purchase requests, in the past, we would have to search two to four different locations to figure out if that was already owned on campus. Now we only have to look in one place. So that's a much more efficient process for us. I don't know that main campus's process has changed much, but we are the ones that are selecting within those law, the K classes of LC, so that they can at least confirm that we have something they think we should have. We have also had a significant improvement of library relationships across campus. If you rewind a decade ago, the libraries, I get the impression, didn't really speak to each other. And with this project, uh, we were very engaged in the migration process, and we're still engaged in the governance going forward. We know our counterparts. I actually had a group of catalogers swimming campus over at law about a week ago, just so we could talk about things. And five years ago, that wouldn't have happened. Um, this means that in addition to having good relationships, we have more opportunities to collaborate and share. Uh, my, one of my personal <laughs> achievements over the last six months is that we are able to borrow materials for courses or from main campus, which if we did that in the past, we were doing a lot of duplication where we had to create our own new inventory records and barcode things, band things, and now we can just loan things across libraries. It was dealing with some of the politics, but it's so much easier now that we are in a shared tenant. Um, and finally, I, I think I've hit on this, but it's it's about saving resources too. And that's, yes, we've realized financial savings, but we're also saving people's time. Uh, we have these collaborative efforts. We have better relationships. We have more people that can help troubleshoot. And then saving our staff time and providing one unified approach, we, in theory, are also saving our patrons' times in the public catalog. All right. So now I'll talk about some of the benefits of having like a shared uh, discovery interface so what you find in our instance. Uh, it's going to start sounding really redundant because a lot of the things that uh, a lot of the benefits and pitfalls of sharing an LSP are also the same as sharing a discovery layer. So um, one of the big ones, like Lauren was mentioning, is that um, we at the law school are able to um, basically um, offshore our work to the main campus library. So. At the law school, we have less than 20 staff members. We're currently at full staff at 16, but over the past four years that I've been employed there, we've been um, chronically understaffed. And we really haven't been able to allocate our resources towards people who are um, able to focus on the discovery layer. And so we've been really, really fortunate to allow, or be able to now allow main campus who has about 10 times the amount of staff members to actually handle that for us while we can focus on ultra critical tasks like just keeping the lights on, doing cataloging, doing circulation, things like that. Um, and a second really major thing, uh, benefit of having a shared discovery layer like Lauren was mentioning is now we have a uh, campus courier, so, or we are now linked to the campus courier. Um, so with the shared, which lets us loan between our library and the main campus library. So, now our users can go into the shared viewfind and once they click out of our law scope, they can select you know, a book that's in our business library and say, or in main campus's business library and say, hey, actually that's relevant to our research or my research and click it and say, hey, can you deliver it to the law library? And that happens in usually two days um, time to get that book. It's great. Um, and so now our, um, faculty, students, and staff have access to 8.5 8 million titles versus our original 250,000. Next slide. So um, just to piggyback on what was in the Colorado, we have 
all of um, this, that those same uh, benefits. Um, some of the ones that are particular to Barry are that um, all of our IT problems went to South Florida. Um, our, we have our own um, uh, law IT department, but it's very small and they don't handle anything to do with our ISP. Our LSP um, is all maintained by our main campus IT, which is much more robust, larger staff, and they are able to do just about everything. Um, we can uh, run all our own things. Um, we use Panorama, um, and we're still implementing that, so I can't say a lot about it, but um, we are able to do almost everything we need to do on our own, run reports, do all of our workflows, um, but if we need any support, of course, main campus is there. Um, we also maintain um, our own resource contracts but everything else to do with our LLC is completely done by me. Um, they were the ones who decided that I think we pay a small percentage, but they pick up the rest. Um, so we didn't have a lot of choice in how things were laid out, but um, the price was right, I guess. And then um, again, saving resources, making sure that we have access to everything. When we did the migration, because we had to cooperate on getting everything set up, we found duplicated resources, all kinds of databases that had multiple subscriptions. We were able to clear all of those things out. And um, as I mentioned, main campus shoulders most of the LSP costs, which lets us put that money towards other resources. So lots of benefits. Now the fun part. It's yeah. <laughs> the complaints. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the complaints, the challenges of being in a, a shared system. And I really just want to start by when, you know, Rebecca just described the sizes of our staff comparatively. It's safe to assume nothing when it comes to workloads, especially when you have these varying sizes. Uh, my team is five people, and we do the entire scope of technical services functions compared to the 10 plus person cataloging unit at our main campus. I, in essence, have one person for each department. Sometimes it's one different person for two to three departments over on main campus. Things look very different. And that was a lot of the conversations that we had to have early on in this process was figuring out how we were different and how we could both work together and be okay that we were different. Um, permission sets, I think, are one of those places where we tried very hard to collaborate. And we came up with um, uniform permission sets that we could share for the most part. I will say we have a couple that are law specific because our workflows are just so dynamically different from main campus. My, my biggest example is that my catalogers do the receiving uh, because it's really the best way for us to find our orders in the sea of main campus's records. Uh, and main campus receiving is part of their acquisitions process. So they're very, very different. Uh, the way we have addressed having uniform permission set is that there's usually three levels of permissions for each kind of functional area. And our one person just gets all of the permissions is really how that goes at law while they're much more scoped out at main campus. I will give a caution that you also need to be very aware of who has a permission set assigned. So if say you wanna move, I don't know, loan rules into their own permission set and you take that out of the circ manager, but you don't bother to tell the little library it's really interesting the next time they try to go in and the loan rules are all gone. So it's it's one of those things that you really have to make sure that you're communicating broadly about that. Um, I want to point out that automated processes are also not going to recognize local practice. This has not been a huge issue for us because we don't do a lot of duplicative purchasing across campus. Uh, but if you're using something like the Gobi API or EDI that's bringing in invoices, they don't care. That process does not care that law and main campus wants separate inventory records. If that record exists, it's going to match on the existing record. So you need to be aware that you might need to do some shifting around for orders. Again, it happens like once every month or two for us. It's not a big deal. We have much better relationships, so we know how to resolve it. Um, but it is one of those things that you kind of need to think about when you're setting up some of these practices that things might be matching on the, the other library's records when you don't want it to. And our acquisitions units, this is part of the reason we can see what's going on in the other library's acquisitions unit, though we can't edit any of that. So we at least know, like, oh, wait, that's not our order record attached to this. Um, we should bug them to get them to move it over on something else. 
And, and finally, uh, as we talk about specialized um, services for communities and our specialized patient group, we are a campus of about 37,000 students. There are 700 students in the law school. Those are our core patrons. We are in the same building as the law school and our faculty members are two floors up. So if we have a faculty request that comes into our faculty services librarian, there's a good chance that we can have a 48 hour turnaround to have that delivered to that faculty members in the box or their office. That's not terribly realistic at a lot of much bigger libraries, but it is an expectation that we have set and Mary can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, this is not my first law library and we have faculty coming from all over the place. It's what they expect as well. So we needed to have a way that we could continue to maintain that level of service to our users and the separation that we've created is allowing us to do that. I think now I'm talking about how to avoid them next. Uh, I think it's communication is honestly the key to everything. You have to make sure you have clear communication. Uh, we really struggle on how to incorporate law into the larger communication structure of our university libraries. They are big enough, they have a communications team. We don't. And they had to convince their communications team that they needed to add everyone from law to the newsletters they were sharing out because there were updates about Folio, about Discovery, about all of these systems that we were now sharing in it. And so it's been bumpy, but I think we're in a pretty good place at this point and have, they're very, very, very aware. I now have main campus people that walk into meetings and go, what about law? Uh, so we, we've done our job, but kind of looking downstream again, it's if you're doing something that's this collaboration, you need to make sure that the smaller library is a part of these conversations. You need to invite them to meetings. You need to figure out ways to incorporate their resources into examples that are presented. And if you don't know what the examples are, at law, we always want to see serials, just saying, um, but ask them. people like a smaller libraries are always happy to share that that information um, and make sure they're involved in that decision making process even we have two votes out of a team of about 60 people when it comes to final decision making we can't swing any vote but we can at least go into a meeting and, and speak up about it and if you are that smaller library show up if you need to be present in those meetings, people need to know who you are. They need to know who to come talk to. If something goes wrong, if there's a question, we have had it mostly the last three and a half years. It's really been one person. We're trying to make that be two or three. Um, but again, like if they if they don't know who to talk to, they're probably not going to ask you about it. And I will be honest, I think the smaller library is very frequently going to go with the flow when it comes to changes. There are not a lot of things that main campus wants that we can't deal with. It may not be ideal, but having those internal communication structures really helps us. Uh, I, I will advocate for the larger law community because I, I work with a lot of the, the law people in Folio. If they do speak up, please listen, because a lot of times it's a really crucial function that we are trying to get to work. And if that's not heard, it's gonna have a pretty significant impact on our workflows. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Rebecca. All right, so again, I'm talking about the discovery layer. Um, so one of the early challenges that our law library was worried about, uh, which I've already discussed, but I'll mention it again, was that our collection would be hard to find when combined with the university's library's much you know, larger collection. Um, we asked very, very early for a pre-filtered search. Um, and like in the migration, our migration was lagging towards the end. Um, and so we had a lot more pressing needs like actually going live. Um, so we were really worried that that was not gonna happen with our um, viewfront. However, our vendor pulled through. Um, yes. And so we do have the ability to um, pre-filter, pre pre-scope our search. So that's awesome. And so, Basically, our patrons are actually able to scope that, so that's great. Um, but that is a challenge that we know we could get lost in the deluge of information. Um, the second challenge um, does come from Folio's end, but it pours over into um, the discovery layer of UFIND. Um, because the law library and the university library work independent of each other, both ways, our backend processes like acquisitions and cataloging function different, just like Laura mentioned. 
Um, and so the records that display in viewfind can look different. Um, most of the time, that's not really a big deal uh, because nor, uh, the main campus library's records one outweigh ours millions by millions. And most of the time, the records do look the same. We're still using Mark, et cetera. But there's that one person at the time that one of our records looks different and pops up, and the main campus library goes, what's that? <laughs> and we're like, that's us. And we end up having to go through these conversations where they're like, we don't like that your, the main campus library goes like, we don't like that your record looks that way. And we're like, that's gonna, if we change the way that record looks like and the whatever, hundred other records that look like that, that's going to completely redo our workflow. And that's really hard when we have two people who are doing it versus 10, or that's going to completely like change their job sort of conversation. Um, the third and final challenge I wanted to address um, is somewhat related to the last one, um, but also more about our patrons than our workflows. Um, special library patrons, so a law library is considered a special library um, in the United States is because it has like a special function or a special um, material type or subject matter. There we go, subject matter is probably the best word. Um, so special libraries like have patrons that place different emphasis on different materials or resources. And so in law, they are um, patrons really focus in on spe specific databases rather than the catalog of our, you know, books and eBooks. And so here at, or at law, we'll be more, you know, concerned about those databases than we will be the catalog. So sometimes our, you know, I'm the liaison for the discovery layer of viewfind. And sometimes my colleague at, colleagues at the main campus will come in and ask me like, hey, do you mind if we like switch this one like little thing on the catalog? And I'm like, no one will care here. You just, you changed, you know, that little arrow to a bigger arrow, no one will care. They're going to be in their specialized database. They are not going to know, notice that on the catalog. And I hope that my colleagues at the main library don't feel like I'm too flippant, but it is sometimes that we just don't place that kind of emphasis on our catalog. So sometimes they come to me with problems that I don't think are problems. <laughs> so those are uh, three of the pitfalls of a shared discovery layer. And I could talk about mitigating some of these challenges. Um, so as I mentioned with the last slide, um, that we are worried that our materials would get lost amongst the university library's large collection. Um, and we have, we solved that with a pre-filtered search that our vendor coded for us in UFIND. Um, I also like, if you're not, you know, in viewfind or you don't have that ability to pay the vendor to do that, or the, you don't have a vendor that will, or you're self-hosting, there are other ways um, to go, you know, about this. Like you could teach all of your public services librarians to have a really quick way to show your your special libraries or smaller libraries patients, like, oh, you know, go here. It's everything, but don't worry, there's these really two click, quick clicks, get to your materials. Um, there are, yeah, just have a really quick and easy way, whether it's pre-filtered search or quick, you know, click here once it's to get to your materials just so that your patrons have an easy access to that. And the second um, way to mitigate these challenges is, as Lauren said, communication is really critical. I would say we do a lot of uh, communication, compromising, negotiating with the main library, and I would also just and remind everybody that um, even though we're librarians and uh, a lot of us are perfectionists, that we can't really be perfect. Um, so sometimes you just got to let the little library's 100 weird records go. Um, fortunately, I don't think that person's in the room with you today. So I can say that, but I'm sure we'll get back. But um, that's the end of my recommendation. So. Go for it, Mary. Okay. Well, 
Just to say, I think that I have had students that have never opened the catalog in three years of law school. So I 100% back you up on that, who cares. Um, so uh, again, echoing everything that's been said, we have had the same challenges and um, mitigations, but um, so some are trying to pull out that we're um, special for Barry, where sometimes it's really hard to know who's doing what, especially when you know, um, Boulder's on the same campus, and so even though they have separation and they do have meetings and they have communication, um, we don't have that. Uh, we don't have meetings with main campus. We have um, you know, different locations not close to each other. Um, and so sometimes it makes it really hard to figure out who's doing what versus there's a lot of turnover maybe, and we don't even know if the same person that was doing workflow a few weeks ago is doing the same workflow now. Um, and it can be very difficult, but from the vendor side and, and um, the uh, library side to figure out who's doing what. You can accidentally overwrite settings and instructions from the other library. Ask me how I know. <laughs> I did it accidentally. <laughs> I just fixed something. I destroyed all the loan rules. And I literally was telling my cohort counterpart down at main campus, please don't send someone to Orlando to murder me, but we have to do the loan rules over again. Um, so that is a definite, definite issue is make those, those shared times. And sometimes it's hard to figure out what's separate because we do have separate instances for so many things, but we have acquisition, our acquisitions is locked down. So we can't do anything with each other's acquisitions. And then other times you've set something in the settings and not realizing that it's settings for everyone. It can be an issue. Um, and making the other uh, library aware of how a patrons access our materials. They're different for each of us. They have podiatry students on main campus. We are our law students. We have a lot of weird license issues because of that. Um, and it's difficult to keep communication clear when we're just really not sure who's supposed to do what uh, for the different patrons even. Um, and so uh, one of the issues there is that because we have open Athens, which authenticates on the front end, um, unlike Easy Proxy, which authenticates on the back end, um, we have to keep everything separate up front. So main campus was used to sending out um, links to students on, main, on our campus saying, oh, just find it here. Um, our students can't use those links anymore because of our authentication changes. And getting everybody used to those changes in workflow can be a real issue. Um, we you to the next slide? Yep. So how to guide them? I don't know. Uh, here's some, <laughs> some of the um, communication, of course. But because we don't have meetings, one of the things I focused on is really having one person at each location that is the go-to. I'm that person for law. Marlene um, is the person for main campus, and we lean on each other a lot. That way we don't have to worry about figuring out who's doing what at each location. I send it to her. She figures it out. She gives it to me. I figure it out. Um, and that's that one point of contact, which has made things so much better. Um, we always try to make sure our vendors know to include everyone because they're so used to being, um, you know, just with main campus because main campus has the contracts with them. Main campus is the one that's there, you know, that pays them. <laughs> really care about us, baby. Um, so making sure that we're invited to everything and, and everybody's involved in all the decision making and always trying to copy at least one person when we're making changes in workflow or decision or trying to figure out what's going on, just to, even just to let Marlene know, hey, we're having this thing happening up at law. If you want to jump in, jump in. If you don't want to jump in, that's fine too. Um, and so hopefully that helps us to avoid some of the really difficult pitfalls of this interesting little situation we've got. All right. Any questions or anything we'd love to hear? Um, if any of you are sharing your systems? Yeah, I was, I was wondering if, um, how the enhanced consortium system support um, affects your plans on um, changing your setup and system. Do you do you think you're, do you you will use that? Or just... It's not something we've actually thought about <laughs> at this point for us. Um, it's it's a possibility. We have. One of the, the interesting things that's kind of going on in the background is that in Colorado, we have a, um, it's an interlibrary lending system. Um, it's courier, physical courier based, it's called Prospector. Um, and it's all of the libraries in Colorado. 
And we have been out of that system since a few months before we migrated because we're working on development with Claire of it um, to get the inreach application working. And I'm not sure how the consortial support might also impact that. So we kind of have a lot of moving parts. Um, the main campus at Boulder was one of the biggest lenders in the prospector system. So they are very motivated to get that back up. So that's been a bigger priority on our campus at this point. Have you thought about that at all? No, and actually that's one of the big problems. We don't make any decisions at all like that. Um, so we kind of just go with the flow. Main campus would be the one to decide. Um, they've thought about it either, but good question. So assuming you don't use enhanced consortial support, are there permissions that are lacking in Folio that would really help you out, like being able to uh, filter inventory with something like an acquisitions unit? That would be amazing. Um, it's it was it's really interesting the conversation we had with Main Campus last week. They want to know how to filter all the lost stuff out. It gets a little bit easier for us. We set up all of the names for our locations to have law in front of it. So you can go in inventory, run a search for law, and it's a lot of little clicks. But it's a much easier for us to do that than for them to click everything but law. I think if we could do something like by library, so like if inventory would allow you to filter by library as well as location, that might be nice so that they could pick and they have six or seven branch libraries with main campus. I have all kinds of recommendations for searching in folio. <laughs> <laughs> like anything. <laughs> no, that would be, yeah, that would be amazing. And so, I mean, I know that's, it's both sides of it that because they don't want our records, if they, they could just exclude them, they would be much happier. Um, and if we could exclude all of their stuff, that would, would make things easier. I mean, that's that's why we use acquisitions unit from the cataloging perspective, because they could go in there and filter on acquisitions unit, and then they're just getting our orders, not the thousands more from main campus, especially with that keyword search not being quite as useful as the inventory uh, keyword search. Like the acquisitions unit is absolutely crucial to our workflows at this point. I'm the only small library out there. Well, in Europe. And we're the only small library for us. Yeah, for the Boulder campus. We're the only one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if you mean on our campuses, yes, because there's only going to be usually one law school attached to one main library, but I would imagine we're duplicated in spirit all across the United States yeah. because there's a lot of small libraries, law school libraries that are a smaller part of the large but it's only for law libraries not for that, um, like subjects I, I mean in some ways a lot of for us a lot of it is the financial and administrative splits so there are i mean we have like a science library and a music library but they're all considered under the main university library uh places where you have like a medical school they may be in the same boat um our Campus has three physical locations, and the medical school is affiliated with the Denver campus. But the medical school, the Denver campus, and the Colorado Springs campuses are all running their own ILS. That was kind of one of the long-term conversations was, did we want to get into a multi-tenant situation with the entire system? And I think everybody else wanted to see how it went with Boulder before they committed to anything, because they were at different stages in their ILS contracts um i'm just gonna say florida is a little bit different it's not very it's very a uh, private law school and a private um university but i used to work at florida state and florida state actually had seven seven different individual libraries there was the main library and then there was a science library attached to the main library and then there was something called the dean directed libraries and that was like being the outcast you know, stepchild, <laughs> everybody pretended like we didn't exist. Um, and there was an engineering library, a medical library, a law library, an information library, a music library. And so all these dean-directed libraries were standalone, independently run. And But on the other hand, the state of Florida has a gigantic circulation ILS that it runs. 
literally all the schools everywhere. Um, and so it's just this weird monster conglomeration of individual things and statewide things. And um, yeah, it's a mess. Um, it's, it's, in some ways, we're luckier <laughs> than they are because it's still kind of a mess. But all these different permutations are happening with all these small libraries, supposedly independent, but kind of not too. I think it will be really interesting the Galileo system, which is the Georgia State Libraries, is going up on Folio next year, um, I think. And there are two law libraries in that system. Uh, you have Georgia State and the University of Georgia, and they do two very different things. Um, the University of Georgia somehow managed to not be a part of the catalog system that the rest of the state was using. So they were their own thing. Um, they are joining into it, but they are still going to be their own tenants. And then you have Georgia State, who is already a component of their main campus libraries. So some of this is, it's so library by library specific, it's hard to answer. Um, my previous institution, uh, we had the main campus and the law library, but within our catalog, we also had a community college that was located like an hour away. We had a science school that was 45 minutes away. Um, and then we had, I was in Williamsburg, Virginia, we had the Colonial Williamsburg Rockefeller Library that we were all in a shared tenant because we only had system support at the main campus university libraries. So a lot of it depends on the resources as well as to who's going to manage things and what kind of accesses you need. So um, it's an, they're an interesting animal. Do you share favorites? Yeah. yeah, and we we had to do some, that comes from our OIT. Uh, we did have to do some finessing because when we were separate, they had two separate scripts for pulling out our patrons and they considered law patrons graduate students. Whereas we gave the law, the law students their own special sets of permissions. Like, and we let our law faculty check things out for longer periods of time. So we had to work through some of that. I, there's still a little fine tuning happening, but that was an interesting process too that took us a few months just to get it sorted out to make sure we were getting the right groups. And then OIT is now asking if they can change things. And I think everybody's very tense. <laughs> Yeah, let's see. If there aren't any other questions, we can get everything.